scoring explosion where we talk all things offense. And uh, Hockey, I know you have been uh, waiting for this all night. You've got some special special video uh, that we have, I believe. And um, and you also want to highlight a very odd formation from Purdue that you saw. <laughs> yeah, this is a – Boomer, maybe you can help me out here. What is this? I've never seen this. There's a, There appears to be – like seven or eight guys on the offensive line. They haven't done this since like the 1890s. I was gonna say, it looks like something I, mean, I can see in a on a drawing from a 1902 football yeah, field the, guy. The quarterback that's, is that's fascinating. Un, yeah, yeah. For the people listening on the podcast tomorrow and days after that, um, the quarterback is lined up under center, and then there looks to be like a a, a player behind him in a straight line with his hand down. I don't know. Uh, he looks full of himself. I'll call him a fullback. And then there's a guy. It almost looks kind of like the letter I, so I'll just call this guy an I back. But so th- I don't know what this formation would be called. But what I've been told is that uh, Nebraska can't run this anymore because we're a spread attack. You know, we we're a shotgun spread team, so we can't get under center. We can't put double tights on the field and, and run out of the I formation. But uh, Purdue, who they are a spread offense and they throw the ball around as much as anybody, they got into this at the goal line last year or last week against Maryland, and they scored a touchdown on it. So I, I had to take a photo of it. Is this is this not a Maryland eye? You're in Maryland. You have to run the eye formation. Is that right? No. But that's just an eye eye, not a Maryland eye. A Maryland, yeah. eye would have, Maryland eye would have another running back back there. Yeah, yes, I know. I'm been, row, I was yeah. just yeah. joking. But this is this does look like something akin to the day before you even had a position called a wide receiver. Everyone was just an end at this point. Yeah, yeah very old school here. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, but so. uh, very effective. Honk, I believe they scored. And is that right? Yeah, so they scored on this play, and for uh, you know teams that struggle in short yarded situations or struggle in in uh, goal line situations, and I, how many times we, we've screamed at the top of our lungs about you know on fourth and ones, and we get in the shotgun, it's like get under center, get a first down. Well, that's what Purdue did, and uh, actually this last week we had a fourth and one where we emptied the backfield and threw an incompletion, the back, yeah. much yeah. to the chagrin of a of a lot of Husker nations. So. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that from, from Purdue. The other thing, and I always highlight this is the run pass ratio. And in this case here this week, um, you know, we had 37 passes to 28 rushes. There was also a sack in there. So really when you adjust that, that's 38 passes, to 27 rushes. And I mean, I'll be as blunt as I can be. And I was this way after the Northwestern game. So as far back as week one, that's not a winning formula for us. Not, not as we continue to go on, we've got to be able to, to commit to a run. We've got to be able to um, do more things to be able to control clock. And, and uh, if we're going to throw the ball around like that, I mean, I just, I think that we're going to run into a lot of pitfalls here the next six games. Um, And so, I I mean, before I get into the, into my uh, uh, film session here, I guess, Dave, I mean, do I make too much of a deal out of that, the run pass there, or is that, are you on board with that? No, yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Um, we just need to be more effective running the ball. And I think to your point on previous uh, shows, we need to be more creative with that because, I mean, look, I, I appreciate, I think it was last week in the Indiana Indiana game, you kind of came to the defense of the offensive line and said, hey, they, you know, are doing some, some more positive things. And they struggled again <laughs> this week. But I think your point still stands that, if you know you have a, a offensive line that's having issues both with run blocking and pass blocking, you got to be more creative on how you're scheming that. You can't just expect them to um, form a perfect pocket for Casey when he's throwing the ball, or just uh, hand off the ball to your your running back uh, with no deception whatsoever, and expect that they're going to make a hole for him. So um, the coaching staff needs to help the offensive line, but. Um, they are still struggling, um, and mm-hmm. um, and uh, we need to figure that out if we're going to win some of these six games. Well, here, let's help them figure it out, and we've got a little film session here. We, All have, right. three, we have three plays, and this is going to be on slow motion loop because we're going to spend a little time on each play, kind of breaking it down. For the, the people on YouTube here watching this live and over the next few days, you'll have a chance to kind of see the play over and over again as, as we talk about it. Um all these plays are going to be out of the same formation. It's the unbalanced set that we've been running, where we take one of our tackles, whether it's the left or the right, and we switch them over to the other side. So the first play that we're looking at right now is the first interception that uh, that Casey throws in the first quarter with a, a minute 20 left. And so right now the guy's catching the interception here. Casey gets destroyed in the backfield. Now, if you watch this, the left guard comes down and blocks 
blocks down, and then we we curl the the center around to block the defensive end on the on the left, which in and of itself is already kind of a, a tough block there. Instead of just pa- a normal pass pro, you're we're doing some kind of a stunt basically between guard and center to pass pro against the nose tackle and the defensive end. So up front, already we're having a little bit more of a challenge there t- blocking that. Now in the backfield, we have a very lousy backfield play action. I, um, I, I don't even know, know if I'd call it a play action. So from the defensive side, we talked about the eyes. You have to use your eyes. We're not forcing the defense to have to do anything there. It's easy as, easy as pie that this is going to be a pass play. So that means the front four, front seven, if you're blitzing, you're coming. If you're the defensive back, you're, go- you're going back. There's no deception up there. And Casey isn't allowed to step into this play because the defensive end gets around the, the center who curls around to make the block. He can't really step into the throw, so he underthrows it, gets intercepted. But for what it's worth, even if he would have got into the throw and got it over him, it's still probably either going to get intercepted by the safety coming over or yeah. the, at the very least the receiver is going to get destroyed. So that one. Yeah. Yeah. There's, not a, there's not a lot of good out of this play to begin with. And so this might be one of those ones where – you know, we talked about on the defensive side with Bush that you you rip out some plays, you rip out some things that you know what I don't see a lot of good. This might be one of those ones I kind of rip out and just say there's not a lot that I, that I see that I like out of this. Now, also the other thing is Casey takes the big hit, and remember that because I've mentioned a lot. You know, I want to get the QB run game going. I want the the QB's legs being involved. I get told you can't do that because we got to keep him healthy. Well, keeping him in the the pocket isn't a way to keep him healthy right now. Okay, so Mark, the, can I ask you uh, yeah, before you leave this one? Can you uh, let me just? I always learn a lot from this. I hope our listeners learn a lot from Hockey's X and O's too here. But so in this instance, uh, it's Trent Hickson, the center who mm-hmm. who shifts over, and you look initially like he um, is squared up and is in a good position to block number seventy one who comes in and hits Casey. It looks mm-hmm. like there might be a little um, little uh, hands to the face there by the Rutgers defender and, and Hickson kind of just olays him. He just goes right past Hickson suddenly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I guess the, the question I have is like, why from an offensive scheme would you ask your center to, to do this? And, you know, instead of just a regular straight up mm-hmm. block, what's the advantage of sliding your center out like this in a pass bro scenario? You know, you know I'm used I, to like offensive linemen getting pulled to run the ball, but what's the point here? Well, and, and play number three will have an example of pulling a guy, but that's a great point. To me, it, it's very awkward. It's a, it's a lot to ask the guy to snap and make that little curl around anyways. So he's moving to the left to get to the guy, and the guy gets around him going the opposite direction, going inside him. Um, it just it, To me, it just seems like if you just snap this ball and just have the center blocking the nose tackle and you have the left guard just blocking the D-end who's lined up head up on him, that would simplify yeah. things. Right. I mean, just at the very core of it, if you just do that alone, it seems to simplify it. There was a I highlighted a play a couple games ago, um, one of the ones that we lost. So I, I think it might have even been like Georgia Southern. But we did one where we pulled uh, Corcoran, the left guard. We pulled him all the way to the right side of the field to block a rushing linebacker coming. And he whiffs and the guy gets right around him. And it was like, man, that was a long you know, that was a really just a strange design to block, a you know, an outside guy. I mean, if we're. If we're struggling this much in the in just a pure pass pro pocket game, maybe simplifying things to the point of 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 just having you know left tackle to, to right tackle lined up in the right spots and not not switching them so much <laughs> left to right is that might be an option if you're trying to do you know anything that's going to take more time. Now that's the other thing too. This is a play that's going to take some time to develop. So those plays that are going to take more time to develop. They might be some of the ones that I'd be ripping out of the playbook. Let's go to in a interception number two. Now, this is another one of the uh, unbalanced sets. Again, the right tackle, the far right tackle is actually the right tight end. That's Corcoran. So Corcoran moved from the left tackle over to the right tight end spot. And on the left side of the of the line is only the left guard. And then the tight end is, is lined up where the left tackle would be. Uh, as we watch this, so he throws the interception. Now, as you watch the right tight end, which is Corcoran, he gets beat around by by the guy he's going up against here. The guy gets around him pretty quickly. Now, to Corcoran's defense here, the guy has been our left guard to start the season. Then with injuries, he moves to our left tackle spot. Now in this pit play, we're moving him over to the right tackle spot. And that's, in and of itself, we've added a complexity to something that we're already struggling with, which is drop back, pass pro blocking. You know, everything becomes opposite 
when you switch from left to right. Your footwork's different. Your hands are different. Everything is. And look, I'll be the first one to say that Corcoran has struggled. I mentioned it earlier. He was a left guard on a play earlier this year, pulling to block a guy, and he struggled there. Well, you know, we've got him in multiple positions, both sides of the line. And what can we do to simplify things? The other thing is, look at the backfield motion here by Casey uh, and the, the running back. I mean, if it's a play action at all, it's a weak play action at best. So we're not doing anything to make the defense have to see things pre-snap. We're not motioning guys across the field doing jet sweeps. We're not doing any kind of two-hand play action motion with like a mesh or anything. The defense knows what we're doing basically the second it snaps. So they can play as fast as they want against us. So these are a couple examples. These are a couple plays where, you know, I think what we're doing is these plays take a little bit more time. We're moving guys around in the spots. They're not always playing. We're doing some weird, we're doing some weird, more unconventional kind of blocking uh, on it. And I think there's, there's, there's things that can be done to simplify this. So do you have any questions before I move on to the, to the positive play here? Yeah, well, well, one question I have is, like, who would be making these decisions on how the offensive line blocks his plays? Is this more of a Whipple thing or a, a Rayola thing? That's a great question. I I mean, all offseason, I would have told you that Whipple and Frost were working together and creating this great scheme, and that's how you do this. Right? I mean, that's if you and I were co-offensive coordinators working together, that's what we'd do, Right. And then, you know, based off of what we hear, at least, it didn't always seem like that worked out that way, right? So yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know who designs this play. You know, Osborne, I remember talking with Milt Teneper back in the day, Mac and I, and Teneper would talk about Osborne. He's like, he's he's the best coach on the staff, period. I mean, he could coach running backs better than Frank could. He could coach offensive line better than I could. He could, you know, he knew every position. And to that point, I mean, Osborne probably – to draw up the play from start to finish every single position and say, this is how I want it blocked. This is how I want every step of every single guy being made. I don't know right now. I don't know if Rayola creates these little, these little, you know, twist movements and all that, the, the pulling on yeah. some of the plays. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, the play I want to show here, because right now. Oh, I was just going to ask, Conky. Yeah, but hmm? my question was, you know, you, you've gone on these unbalanced lines here. Was our first touchdown out of an unbalanced line? I mean, what did we do something differently yeah. on that one or? Yeah, so this touchdown number one is out of the unbalanced line, and I wanted to highlight that oh, is that this isn't convenient. a knock. This isn't a knock on the formation. It's not that the formation itself is bad. We've had a lot of success running out of the unbalanced line to the weak side because when you think about what the unbalanced line does, you have a guard tackle tackle to one side. It forces the entire defense really to have to overshift, and then if you run to the back side of it, as long as the tight end Volklek, if he can. On the back end, if he can get his block, I mean, a lot of times you have a numbers advantage on the weak side of it. So there's advantages to it. And this play that we're going to score here to Volklek, as you see, it's unbalanced to the left. So the right tackle is actually Volklek. And the left tackle or the right tackle switches over to the left tackle spot and the left tight end is uh, Corcoran. Now, let's watch it again. The right guard here, Bando, he pulls. Now, this is a full pull. I mean, he is moving from right to left. To, and everything is a run motion. Uh, Casey has a two-hand mesh zone read to Grant. So the defense, watch the defense flow to the right here. This is a handoff to Grant as far as they're concerned. The pulling motion of the, of the right guard actually even further um, makes that look like it's going to be a handoff to the left. Uh, Greg Sharp, if you listen to the radio call of this, he totally was burned by it and said it's a handoff to Grant. Oh, no, no, it's not. That's the deception. And look at the defense, all the eyes that they have to have. Now, here's the thing. Watch number, I think it's 17 on defense here. He's the left outside linebacker or maybe a corner. He ultimately, he turns around and he's like, oh, shit, I should have had Vokalek. And he's late. He doesn't get him. All right, so Purdue's going to watch this game. And Purdue's going to say, we got to make sure that we don't have let this happen. This dude, number 17 for Purdue, you're going to have to cover Vokalek. If he covers Vokalek, Casey has to pull it and run. He has to be yeah. willing to run it. This becomes a really a triple option, essentially. You know, it's do you hand the ball off to Grant? Uh, you're everything's quick. This isn't a, a long setup play. The, the, everything's intended to, to get rid of the ball quick. And Vocalex either going to be open or the guy is coming up. You know, if the guy comes up on on uh, Thompson, 
and Vukovic gets behind him, throw the ball. If the guy drops back to cover him, you're going to, you know, Casey's going to have to Huge run it there for Casey to run. Yeah. Yeah. There's multiple yeah. options. There's things going on before the, the play happened. Uh, it makes it an easier play there. And, and these are things that are part of the offense already. I, I don't, I didn't want to come up here and say, oh, we need to start, you know, getting in the I formation and running triple option. I haven't seen us do that all year. So why would I suggest that? It's what are the things that we're already doing well? So think of think of what Bush did on defense. He tore out a bunch of stuff right away and said, we're not doing that stuff anymore. Okay. Now, how do I find a way to get Nelson, Tanner, Mathis on the field? You know, how do I get my best players out there? How do you know? That's what Bush essentially did right here. How do we play fast? And I think what I would start to do, I mean, if I had my kind of my five suggestions here, rip out some of the longer developing plays. We just aren't good at it right now for, for you know, a lot a lot of reasons. If it's going to take four or five seconds in the in the uh, pocket to develop a pass play, a lot of that stuff I'd be ripping out right now. It just isn't, it's not worth it. Simplify some of the blocking schemes, you know, like we did on play one, all the, the little twist motion. I'd get, I'd knock some of that stuff out. The, uh, you know, if we're going to do any kind of three to four second drop back stuff, I would probably do that more in a, a traditional alignment of left tackle to right tackle and try to have everybody in their normal position. Because I think we've seen examples like play number two where Corcoran is playing on the right side instead of the left side and he's being asked to block a different way. And it's just, it we're just adding complexity to something that maybe doesn't need to be as complex. Uh, number three, use some deception in the backfield. Like we saw on, on the third one, the zone read. Uh, pull, you know, jet sweep motion, the pulling of the the guard that actually draws the uh, the defense there. That's you know, all those things in the backfield are things that are going to open you know make the play easier. And this is about simplifying and making things easier. Number four, roll the pocket. I mean, Dave, you've brought that up a number of times. You know, you'll text us every once in a while. You're like, hey, there was a rollout, honky. There was a rollout, and they <laughs> they tend to be once a game easy. Yeah, about once a game, and they tend to be pretty successful roll out of the pocket and Casey's mobile enough to do that. And last but not least, don't be afraid to use Casey's legs. Don't be afraid to run the ball a couple of times. I've never wanted him to run it 25 times a game, but there are times that he has to be able to run it. And if that's five, if that's six, if that's seven times a game, whatever it is, you know, if he came out and ran it eight times or nine times against Purdue, that would be significant because Purdue's not preparing for that. So those are things. And we, we can't think of it as, Oh, well, he can't do that because he's going to be injured. You know, we can't injure Casey and run him. He's getting injured right now without running him. He's getting he's getting some of the wickedest hits, as we saw there on interception one and two, and plenty of other ones. He's already taken those hits. So there are things within the offense, things we've already seen, some strengths. Focus more on those positives. Rip out some of the things that aren't working as well. And, uh, you know, that would be Honky's uh, little film session, I guess. My, my suggestions to Coach Whipple. Well, I learned a lot. Boomer, yourself? No, I thought that was very compelling and rich. I, I like it. So, no. <laughs> no, it was good. It's it's good to see that when you can actually put it to film. Uh, for those of you listening on the podcast, when you have a chance, go check it out on, on YouTube. And you can really, really see what, you know, Honky's talking about. I thought, I thought he did a good job of explaining it for those of you just listening. So, no, well worth, <laughs> well worth a breakdown.